Okay, Jesse, last week was a truly wild romp through ye old frontier murder. What's the story this time around? When a devoted family man loses his wife due to a mysterious sudden death, he is surrounded by sympathy and support. But when three more members of his family die within the next 32 months, that sympathy turns into suspicion. I'm Andy Cassette. And I'm Jesse Prey, and this is Love Murder. Andy. Hi, Jesse. Welcome back, everyone, to Love Murder, a podcast about bad dads getting mad and love gone fatally wrong. You can find Love Murder on TikTok and Instagram at Love Murder Pod and on Facebook by searching Love Murder Podcast. If you enjoy this show, pretty please love slash murder a five-star rating on your podcast app. Subscribe and review to help new people discover the show. Love you guys. Love your reviews. We're still doing stickers. So if you have not taken a screenshot and sent us your review, please do so we can send you a super cool sticker. And we have new stickers too. So even if you've got the old school one, we've got a new one for you. Yeah. And if you also want to support the show more directly and support us more directly, head on over to patreon.com slash lovemurderpod where you can learn all about the different tiers of our Patreon support. Yeah, absolutely. You guys, your Patreon has been keeping us going. Thank you for our Patreon supporters for making all of this possible. And speaking of Patreon, we're so excited, as always this week, to welcome and shout out a new set of wonderful patrons. Welcome to Shelby M. and Kristen C. Judith T. and Jessica K. And Deanna N. Welcome and happy almost Father's Day to those of you who celebrate. Crazy. I know. I know it really snuck up on us this year. I know we have a lot of single mom listeners out there as well. So happy Father's Day to you as well. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. Well, I am not going to belabor the point. I think the themes are going to come out pretty strongly throughout this episode. So you do not need any thematic intro from me today. Let me guess. Bad dads. (laughs) Yeah, there's a couple bad dads. Let's get into it. Winona Judd was no stranger to heartbreak. She lived it, she sang about it, and she would do all in her power to help soothe a fellow human's suffering. In 1993, the president of her fan club reached out to her about a big fan, both figuratively and literally, as the man in question was well over six feet tall. He had recently lost both his wife and his four-year-old son. Jack Barron's grieving heart was momentarily lifted when he spoke on the phone to Winona, who personally called him to offer her condolences. Oh, this just gave me goosebumps. To Jack, Winona was simply the best musician of his generation. She blended classic country with modern musicality seamlessly. He was thrilled when she offered him backstage tickets to one of her California concerts. The two shared a meal together, and Jack was struck at how kind, empathetic, and real Winona was behind the glamorous eye makeup and star presence. She offered Jack backstage passes to another show, but only if he'd bring his three-year-old daughter, Ashley. The photo from that 1994 concert depicts a smiling Jack towering over Winona with a sweatshirt emblazoned with a picture of he and Winona from the previous show, with the text above the picture reading, Wise Guy. Like, Winona's guy? W-Y apostrophe S guy? no. (laughs) Oh, no. And it's one of those, like, handmade sweaters with the picture on it. Yes, exactly. PTA vibes. (laughs) Sweet Ashley smiles and strikes a pose, looking happy and at home in Winona's arms. The country star was glad to be able to raise the spirits of the little girl and the man left behind after tragedy. In a few short years and two more mysterious deaths, however, Winona would learn that the man had not been all he had seemed, and her own nightmare would begin. This is a befuddling tale of a family annihilator, possibly a Munchausen by proxy going on in this story, and above all, the heinous acts of a truly horrible dad. 
and the dad who created the monster out of neglect and abandonment. So happy Father's Day, everyone. (laughs) I do have to issue a trigger warning. There will be child death in this episode, unfortunately. Never a good one. Never a good one. This is a listener request as well. Again, with Nancy T. She's really been on a recommendation roll. So thank you, Nancy, once again. So most of my information comes from the book, which I feel like at this point, you guys all know what's happening in this episode, so I'm not giving anything away. Dying for Daddy by Carlton Smith. Oh, and Carlton Smith. A Carlton Smith book, Dying for Daddy. I also consulted Murderpedia. There's a Raider Online article I will quote later on, as well as a Sacramento Bee article. So let's start at the beginning when hulking Jack Barron was just a wee little babe nicknamed Jackie. Jack Barron was born on October 21st, 1961 in Castro Valley, California. He was the only son of 22-year-old dad Elmore Barron and his 19-year-old wife, Roberta. His conception and birth was a point of contention very early on in the marriage, however, because for whatever reason, Elmore fully believed that he was sterile and unable to have children, and that in order to get pregnant with Jack, Roberta must have cheated on him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, Roberta was a devout Catholic who had married him at 18 years old, so to her, this was a wildly offensive suggestion because she had, of course, due to her religion, saved herself for marriage. So this was just a huge slap in their face at what should have been a very happy time in their life. Somehow they managed to get through this, though. It seems like Elmore always had some, not resentment, but just like general distaste for his own son, which is obviously never healthy. No. Yeah, so he worked for the railroad, and he was often traveling, and Jack grew up worshiping him. I mean, it's the same with human dynamics, like the one that is impossible to get to like you. That's who you want to go after. Yeah, you are trying to win over the one who is withdrawing from you, and that was very much what was going on with Jack and Elmore. So when he was home, Jack was doing everything he can to please him. He also became obsessed with model trains because he knew his dad worked for the railroad. And this would be an obsession that would go on into his adult years. So Roberta seemed to try to make up for Elmore's absences by babying Jack and tending to his every need, kind of spoiling him a little bit. And the marriage also was not good. I mean, it didn't start off on a very good foot and it continued that way. They were constantly fighting. And I think that Roberta redirected all of her love to the child, to Jack in that situation. Eventually. Roberta accused Elmore of infidelity because he was gone all the time, which he denied. But it's very possible that it was happening because he basically said, "Okay, well, sure, if you think I'm cheating, I guess I'm just going to leave. And he left. So Jack was about 12 or 13 years old. Jack said 13. Elmore later says 12. When Elmore walked out of both of their lives and Elmore, even to his own admission, only saw his son three times total over the next two decades. Wow. And it wasn't like they were talking on the phone either. They had extremely, extremely limited contact after that. Wow. That's horrible. Super sad. It's just also such a vulnerable time in a young person's life being like 12 or 13 and burgeoning adulthood. Jack definitely felt this absence very strongly in his life. Roberta and Jack moved back to like around the San Francisco Bay area, like she was from like way East Bay, where she was from. And times were very tough. So obviously Elmore wasn't paying child support. They had no money. She had never really worked because she had gotten married right out of high school. She didn't have a lot of skills or education. And she eventually went to work at Safeway. And the mother and son were said to be pretty codependent in that time. Roberta eventually would remarry But it would be too late at that point because Jack was already about 18 years old to really benefit from having a father figure in his life. Of course. At that point, it just kind of felt like this dude was horning in on their situation. After high school, he became a laborer with the railroad, which was where he had wanted to work his whole life because he wanted to be like his dad. And he did work there for two years before he injured himself and he went on disability. 
He was 25 and visiting a good family friend in Shasta, California, when he met a beautiful 29-year-old named Irene Paget. Irene was indeed four years older than Jack, and she already had one failed marriage to her high school sweetheart behind her. But in so many ways, she still seemed naive and young and very overly trusting. Irene was born July 18th, 1957, the fourth and last child of a very close-knit, loving military family. So she was very much the beloved baby. Those who knew her said that her basic nature was kind-hearted and trusting. Irene was never really that great at school, and she wasn't particularly interested in it either. But she loved animals, and she participated in pageants, which her friend said was mostly because her dad encouraged her to do so. She was like. I mean, this is the 70s, and obviously she was born in the late 50s, and she was like this perfect little cutie bun. So I think that it was like his little baby angel. He wanted her to go into pageants. And she was good at it. She was selected as Miss Fallbrook 1974. There's a cute picture of her with her crown on, which I'll try to include in the Instagram. And it kind of gives like baby Daryl Hannah vibes. No, so cute. So she was raised kind of all over because they were a military family. She was, like, born near Reno, but spent time in Germany on a military base. But then Fallbrook, I think, is right – it's, like, north of San Diego, or it's somewhere in the vicinity. So there's still kind of, like, a California girl vibe there. Born to nurture, all Irene really wanted in life was to get married and have a family. She was absolutely devastated when her first marriage didn't work out. And it sounded like they were just together really young, and then the guy wanted to leave, potentially to date somebody else. So that was shocking to her. She didn't see it coming. So Irene moved with her best friend Denise to Sacramento after the divorce, where they shared a house and both worked as secretaries. She was visiting a friend in Shasta who wanted to set her up with her husband's good friend, who was, of course, Jack Barron. The couple immediately hit it off, and within months, Jack moved in with Denise and Irene. There were three bedrooms in this house, one for Denise, one for Irene and Jack to share, and one exclusively used for Jack's model trains. Okay, I thought you were going to say something different. So model trains aren't as bad as what I was thinking. What were you thinking? I don't know. I was like thinking like a room that they both share for intercourse. (laughs) So they have to leave their bed chambers to go to the sex room? Yeah. But the model train thing, I mean, I what I've experienced, it's commonly a hobby for older men. So the thing that just strikes me as kind of odd is he's so young and into it. Like, I feel like it's a retirement hobby usually because model trains are cool. But to have a whole room dedicated to it in your 20s seems a bit much, much. Yes. So it's a lot. And I think it really does have roots with his father, obviously. So, yeah, that's something that, like, Denise thought was a little strange. So (laughs) you're not alone in thinking that. So, yeah, Denise was, like, a little on edge about this whole relationship. She thought that he was kind of young and immature for what Irene was looking for. Now, Irene was 29. She really, really wanted to get married and have a family almost immediately. And Jack said he wanted the same things. But her friend Denise could tell that he just did not seem ready for those responsibilities. He had to be the center of attention himself. He threw tantrums like a child when he didn't get his way. Yeah, it's just like repressed emotions. He's super repressed. And it's that perfect combination of having one absent parent that he worships and then the other parent trying to make up for it and worshiping and spoiling him. Yeah, absolutely to try to be both parents and instead it's it's just a failure of all proportions because he was the type of guy who as an adult like if they played a board game and he was losing would like flip the board yeah it was just his emotions were not in check but Irene seemed to really like him they seemed to get along they had similar values they wanted the same thing and he did seem to put her on a pedestal he thought she was amazing and he really talked her up at a time that I feel like Maybe she wasn't feeling so good about herself. Well, they wasted no time getting started on a family. By spring of 1988, Irene was pregnant. The couple married that very summer, and baby Jeremy John Barron was born on January 8th, 1989. They bought a house in Sacramento with the help from Jack's mother, Roberta, and it seemed that Irene had the life that she had always dreamt of. 
except that life came with a cost. Her friend Denise noted that after the baby was born, Jack became increasingly controlling. He would tell Irene what to wear and how to act, especially when it came to their house. He was insane and fastidious about their house, their lawn, their car, keeping everything clean. He was obsessed with his own appearance and cleanliness. And it seemed like now he saw Denise, his home, and his child as an extension of himself. Okay. So if Jack came home and the playroom or kitchen was like even a little messy, which is impossible for it not to be with a baby and young toddler, he would lose his shit completely. And Denise said she even witnessed her friend vacuuming and he would follow her around with like a paper towel and rub out the tracks of the vacuum so that everything was perfect. So you didn't even see the tracks of the vacuum. Aren't the tracks of the vacuum like a sign that it's clean? That's what I thought. I thought like when people do the really cool patterns. Yeah. <laughs> this is me. I'm doing a zigzag with my hands, guys. <laughs> it's like when, a, you know, somebody has a really cool mowed lawn and it's like done in a cool passion. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, Ooh, that means it's fresh. Yeah. That just seems like a him problem. Yeah. He did not like the tracks. Denise was shocked at Jack's behavior, but she said that Irene took it all in stride. She told Denise that it was just part of his personality and that it had something to do with his mother. So she's like, I've learned to just let it go. It's his thing. It doesn't bother me. Well, Denise thought that Jack holding the family hostage with his temper tantrums and dark moods was a huge red flag. Outwardly, Irene did not seem to bat an eye. She did not seem to think that there was anything wrong with the situation. She was ecstatic to discover she was pregnant again shortly after Jeremy's birth. And she delivered a healthy baby girl named Ashley in March of 1990 when Jeremy was only 15 months old. Wow. So that's two under two. That's tough. I mean, he's barely over one. Well, to her family, Irene seemed filled with joy. She loved her children desperately. I mean, this was the culmination of a dream come true for her. They did need money, though. So they didn't have a lot of money because he was working nights as a shelf stalker at a grocery store at this point, And she was running a small daycare out of her home. But her brother said that he talked to her about life. And she was like, I don't need material things. This is all I've ever needed. We have this house. We have these two beautiful children. I have a loving husband. This is all I've ever wanted in my life. That's incredible. Yeah. So she had a, just a great outlook about all of this. But best friend Denise said that even though Irene was happy on the outside, she had some sneaking suspicions that she wasn't completely satisfied in her marriage or in the way Jack behaved in their marriage. In late May of 1992, she confessed to Denise that she was worried Jack may be having an affair. Oh, no. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Like, she could deal with his misbehavior. She couldn't deal with the fact that he'd be walking out on the marriage or being unfaithful. I mean, it's a horrible feeling. <laughs> she had also converted to Catholicism by this point because it was important to her mother-in-law. So she was really trying everything to be part of this family. Well, I guess Jack had gone to some sort of weekend event for train buffs. I don't know if it was like a conference or a convention or something. And he had traveled with a woman he worked with at the grocery store. No. Yeah. And Irene said to Denise, like, the big red flag for her was when she asked him for a contact phone number for the hotel they were staying at so she could reach him. And he said, don't worry, I'll just call you. Mm. Mm. So Denise tried to talk her friend down. She was like, look, Jack's not the type to cheat. He's not even that good of a liar. Like, Jack wasn't Denise's favorite person, but she really at that point did not think he was a cheater. Okay. So she was like, I think he's just, you know, in weird train land and this is just part of who he is. But, you know, now that you have that inkling, just keep your eyes open. So the following weekend, they were actually going away without their kids. Roberta, the grandmother, was watching them and they were going to get to go to Lake Tahoe to visit some friends. And Denise said that after they came back from that... Irene was so happy. She was so happy. She said it was a wonderful weekend. She was like, yeah, I think I was just being crazy. I think everything's fine. So at that point, she, she was like, I'm, I'm happy again. Things are good. Irene had already been divorced once before, and it seems like this almost toxic 
positivity about the relationship stemmed from never wanting to break up her family and never going through divorce again. Yeah, of course. And maybe she took her conversion to Catholicism seriously. I mean, it seems like she did take anything involving her family and values very seriously. On June 8th, 1992, a neighbor of the Barons named Christina Hamilton went to drop off her child at Irene's daycare, which was in their home, around 7 a.m. and head off to work. But no one answered the door. She knocked and knocked and knocked, but she heard nothing. So she's confused. She's also frustrated. She needs to get to work. And her daycare provider isn't answering the door. So she ended up making other child care plans. There was somebody that was staying at her house that would be willing to watch her kids for a few hours. So she left them at her own house and then went to work. But as she was driving to work and even when she got there, she was like, this is really weird. This feels strange. This isn't like Irene. Also, she has a three and a two-year-old at home. Where on earth would she be at seven in the morning? And were her kids home? Something seems wrong. And so she couldn't shake the feeling. So she tried to call her like several times right in a row and there was no answer. So she's like, okay, screw it. I'm not going to feel good about myself if I don't go back to her house and figure out what's going on. So it was only 8 a.m. This all had happened in like an hour when she went back to the Baron's house. After several more knocks with no answer, Christina began to try to get into the house. So she's, the front door is locked. She starts going around the house. The side door was like a sliding glass door. It's locked. She's pulling at the windows to see if any of the windows are open to see if she can get in anywhere. And they're all locked. And while she was trying to get into one of the windows, a little flash of a little person went by and she saw that it was Jeremy, the three-year-old. Okay. So she went to the side door and she started tapping on the side door until she got the three-year-old's attention. And she coaxed him into unlocking the side door so that she could get in. And so when she got in, she was like, where's your mom? And he said, I can't wake my mommy up. Oh, my God. So Ashley was up too, but she's like our kid's age. So, you know, they're not as verbal as a three-year-old. So she was just kind of like following her big brother around. And it was clear that the kids were in their bed clothes. No one had helped them in the morning. And she went to Irene's room with the three- and two-year-old trailing behind her. And she immediately realized that something was very wrong. It wasn't like a bloody crime scene or anything. It was just that there was an eerie stillness in the room. It was just you could tell that there wasn't life happening. And Irene was lying in a really weird way. She was still wearing a pink nightgown and pink fuzzy slippers, but she had a pillow placed over her head. When Christina lifted the pillow, which was stained with makeup, an indication that she hadn't taken off her makeup from the night before, she saw blood trickling out of Irene's nose and a pool of blood underneath her head. Oh, God. And Irene's eyes were looking blankly at the world that she was now no longer a part of, unfortunately. So Christina, of course, had her heart in her throat and ushered the children into their bedroom very quickly and was like, I just have to make a phone call. And then she called 911. The EMTs who arrived on the scene only minutes later confirmed what Christina already knew. Irene was dead. Andy, nothing in the world matters as much to us as our kids' health. So I'm excited to share our sponsor today, Haya Health. Absolutely. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. Filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. And that's why Haya was created. It's a pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Did you know that most children's vitamins are filled with five grams of sugar? Uh, yes, it's like ketchup. Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk, yet it tastes great and is perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with the yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, it has a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies and is supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. 
Haya is designed for kids of all ages and sent straight to your door so parents have one less thing to worry about. Always so ideal. Absolutely. And I've talked about this before, but my dad's a dentist and he sees all the time such wonderful, well-meaning parents coming in with little kids who have cavities because of gummy vitamins. Which also, I got to say, guys, I love giving my kids ice cream, maybe the occasional treat, some candy every once in a while. I want to make sure I know when they're getting that sugar. Yes. And yes. not be also giving that sugar to them with their vitamins. Absolutely. Also, I don't know if you saw, but it comes with these cute little stickers that you can customize the bottle with their name and make it kind of unique for them. And they were so cute and fun to do with Echo. Yeah, it really makes it their own. We have worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. You can receive 50% off your first order. And to claim this deal, you just go to HayaHealth.com slash lovemurder. This deal is not available on the regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash lovemurder and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. There did not appear to be any foul play because the doors were locked. It looked like like the blood trickling out of the nose could happen if you had some sort of aneurysm or something. It didn't appear like she had been like beaten. It did not appear like she had been sexually assaulted in any way. Pillow over the face is a little eerie. The pillow over the face is very, very odd. But yeah, there was no reason for an otherwise healthy 34-year-old woman to just drop dead. So detectives were called because that was kind of weird. But again, the doors were all completely locked. So they didn't know how somebody would have come in to do anything to her. Just as the homicide detectives were arriving, Jack came home from work because he worked nights, arriving roughly around 9.30 in the morning. He was told that his wife had been discovered in their bed, deceased by their neighbor. And Jack was completely shocked by the news. He began to cry, and he was asking to get into the house to be with his wife. So he's trying to get into the house. The police stopped him. Jack asked all the right questions. I mean, a lot of times we hear these red flags like, so weird, they didn't ask how they died. They didn't ask where they are. They didn't ask to see them. He did all of those things. He said, what happened? How could this happen? I want to be with her. Where is she? Jack told the police that he had been at work since 11 o'clock the previous night, and when he left, Irene had been in bed but alive. He said he hadn't been home since, and Jack could not think of any health issues that would have caused Irene to suddenly die. He did say, though, that she'd been battling a pretty bad cold and cough, suffering from chronic headaches lately. To the detectives, he appeared genuinely shocked and in grief in their initial feelings was that this was natural causes. He has an alibi like he was at work. He was at work. And then it turns out later he took a coworker to the hospital who was feeling sick herself. So he was at work and then he was with this coworker at the hospital and then he dropped her off and drove home. Weird. Okay. Yeah. We'll get more into that later. So no one had any idea how Irene had so suddenly passed away. So naturally, the coroner was called. They needed him to solve this medical mystery. He found that according to the lividity and rigor mortis, as well as Irene's body temperature, that Irene could have died as early as 7.30 p.m. the night before. Whoa. So if that's the case, how would have Jack known that she was alive and well before he left for work at 11 p.m.? The pillow on her face was not necessarily indicative of foul play, the coroner thought. The coroner said that people who routinely suffer from headaches will sometimes place a pillow over their head to block out the light. Yeah, or an eye mask. (laughs) I know, you'd think a lady that has like matching fuzzy slippers to her nightgown would also have like a nice eye mask. But yeah, so he didn't necessarily think that that was a sign of anything nefarious. And while Irene did have burst blood vessels in her eyes, the small petechial hemorrhages we've talked about which can be indications of asphyxiation, he thought it could also be due to the agonal dying process. But after her autopsy, the coroner could still find no reason for Irene to have passed away. I mean, he's looking at her organs, he's looking at her brain, he just cannot find a way natural or otherwise. He was convinced, though, that there had to be a rational explanation, and because the authorities on the scene had no reason to suspect Jack or foul play, 
absolutely no one thought that Irene had been murdered at this point. There was no red flags about their situation whatsoever. Okay. Well, the police were not suspicious of Jack. Irene's family was starting to have reason to be. John, Irene's brother, said that he had a gut sense that Irene had been killed. When he first found out that she was dead, he wasn't like, oh, what happened? He was like, oh, she's been killed. That was like the weirdly first thought that flitted through his brain. He also thought it was strange because he went with Jack to the funeral parlor. And I guess the, the guy at the funeral parlor said, hey, if you get a double plot so that when you end your life, you can be with your wife, you get a discount. And Jack was like, yeah, let's do that. And so Irene's brother, John, like put a hand on his hand and was like, dude, you're 30 years old. You're 30 years old. You have your whole life ahead of you. I hope you find somebody and meet someone who is a great stepmother to my niece and nephew and you build a beautiful life together. So you could have a second wife that's you're with for 40 years or more and you're going to be buried next to my sister. Like, just get a single plot and you can work this out later. Yeah. But he insisted on it, which John thought was really odd. He's like, why is he insisting on getting this double plot? So he thought it was weird, but he would not think it was sinister until months later when the second grave would also be filled and not by Jack Barron. Oh, no. The other red flag for Irene's family was when Jack moved a woman named Starla and her children into the family home mere weeks, weeks after Irene died. I'm Starla. (laughs) Not only that. He was giving away or throwing away all of Irene's things. Within six weeks, it was almost as if Irene had never existed. Starla was not only the co-worker Jack had brought on the train trip, but she was also part of his alibi. Mm. She is the one who had gotten sick at work and he had taken her to the hospital at the end of his shift. Starla, once she was stabilized, had been driven home by Jack, and then he had directly gone to his house, where he discovered that Irene had passed away in the night. This paired with the fact that the medical examiner had concluded that Irene had died of undetermined causes, which is no conclusion at all, deeply unnerved Irene's family. They were the ones who were trying to chase down the coroner and... They thought they would get the coroner's report like within a month. And it was going on multiple months now and with no answers. So they're trying to chase down the coroner. Meanwhile, he's already got some woman moved in with her children. Starla, Jack's new live-in lover, was also becoming unnerved though. She did not suspect Jack had anything to do with his wife's death because she had been with him all night and in the company of many people, not just Starla. She did hate the way he treated his children though. Hmm. And she had never seen him really with his kids prior to this point. And she was really upset about how things were going because she had her own children. And he was mostly hands off with her children. He understood that that was her job to discipline them. But the way he treated his own children was pretty bad. So she found out immediately that Jack would absolutely lose it if the kids did not do exactly as they were told and how he wanted them to act. Which, when your kids are two, three, and four, is impossible. Yeah. There's no way. They don't have the language skills or the emotional skills to be able to be perfect little automatons. It's just not, and it's not emotionally healthy for them to be. So Starla watched in horror as Jack's parenting grew worse and worse as he became more frustrated and he was not a good single dad. On one November evening, when Jeremy was almost four, he was suffering from a really bad cold. This kid, this poor kid went through it. After his mother's death, he was emotionally bereft. And I think his immune system was down from grief because he was constantly getting ill. He was really sad. He was really down. He was very whiny, but because he was lost and alone and sick. and because Jack worked nights, he would need to sleep in the afternoon before he went to work. And there was one night, it was like an afternoon basically. And I guess that Jack was supposed to be napping before he went to work. But Jeremy was 
really sick and he wasn't feeling well. And he kept screaming and crying from his room. And he eventually, he was about four at this point. He went into Jack's room and he was screaming that he wanted his mommy. He kept screaming that he wanted his mommy over and over and over again. So obviously the right thing to do is to hold and comfort your child who is obviously suffering in multiple ways. But that is very far from what Jack did. Instead, and Starla witnessed this, he started screaming at him. He started yelling at him. He started spanking him. And she overheard Jack yell to Jeremy, if you don't keep quiet and get to sleep, I'll make sure you go to where your mother is. Oh, so he's not even like trying to hide it. No. And Starla said that she obviously knew what it was like to parent young children. So she was like, I'm really hoping that's an outburst. Mm. I think that she's actually like giving herself an out later because she left after this. I mean, she dumped him. She's moved out. She's gone. But when they asked her why, when she overheard that, she didn't alert the authorities. I think when she said, well, I just thought it was frustration. I just thought it was hard to raise kids that are two, three, and four. I think she was just kind of giving herself an out because she probably felt bad about not going to the authorities later on. Yeah. I mean, but like, what are you supposed to do? Like, (laughs) she's supposed to like literally go to the cops and say, this is what he said. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the cops in situations like this that we've heard in the past would like laugh at that. They probably wouldn't care. But the fact that she had died so mysteriously and there was particular hemorrhaging and a pillow found on her face would make you think that maybe that little bon mot would have got the process started. But I think you're right. I mean, she probably was like, look, I'm recently single because she was separated from her husband when she moved in. And has kids. And has two kids herself. I don't want to get involved in this. I mean, it's like horrifying on all fronts. Yeah. So she leaves. So she left at some point in November or December and she takes the kids with her too. And this means that the children's lives are disrupted once again. So Jeremy, again, was affected the most by this and he lost his mother. Now he lost his mother type figure. In early February of 1993, a depressed Jeremy was once again battling a horrible cold. And this time he had this deep congestion in his lungs. And they said that it caused him to cough so hard that it sounded like he was retching. He was coughing so hard. Oh, my God, this poor baby. So on Sunday morning, February 7th, Jack gave Jeremy two doses of this cold medicine and he put him to bed. It was basically like he gave it to him earlier in the morning and then like mid-morning. At 12.45 p.m., a 17-year-old babysitter named Jennifer came over to watch the kids while Jack got some sleep before his night shift. Only when she went there, no one was answering the door. So she's ringing the doorbell. She's knocking. Nobody's answering the door. She went home because she lived in the neighborhood, and she ended up calling the Barons about 15 minutes later. And at that point, Jack answered the phone and he explained that he must have been in the shower when she came by. He forgot when she was coming. So he's like, actually, I do still need you to babysit. Can you come back? Which she did. And she said that when she arrived, both children were napping. And Jack told her that she should not let them sleep for more than three hours. So he's like, they just got down. Do not wake them up. So she peeked in on the kids at that point, And she saw that Jeremy was lying on his right side with his little face turned towards the bedroom wall. So she couldn't see his face. It was just like he's facing away from her. I can't believe he's involving the babysitter in this, by the way. This is infuriating. Well, this is going to be his MO too, by the way. So Ashley was also asleep and little Ashley woke up first at 2.40 p.m. Jennifer then went in to check on Jeremy because she was like, okay, Ashley's up. Maybe I'll get Jeremy up at this point too. So they're both up. And she knew immediately that unfortunately something was very wrong. Jeremy was in the exact same position that he had been when she had first checked on him almost two hours earlier. So she ran into Jeremy's room and she tried to shake him awake, but he could not be roused. She said that her eyes went like blank, almost like her mind went blank, actually. Like everything went blank at that moment that she's like, this child is lifeless. I don't know what to do. And so she tore into Jack's room because he was still sleeping because he was about to go to work. And she shook him awake and she was screaming, there's something wrong with Jeremy. He's not getting up. And so she's like, go to him. I'm going to call 911. 
So he's still kind of like getting out of bed. She's already at the phone calling 911 and she's yelling to Jack while she's on the phone to the dispatcher. The dispatcher says to do CPR. Can you do CPR? Can you start CPR? Like she's like freaking out. And Jack came around the corner, looked at his son and then said to the babysitter, don't bother. It's too late anyway. Um, this is your child. Your child. And they even talked about how the EMTs came and they already knew that he was passed away. But they have a protocol where they do all of the life-saving things when it's a child, like almost more for the parents. So the parents can see that there was an effort, that they did everything, that their child was unable to be revived despite doing literally everything, taking him to the hospital, letting the doctors do everything they could do. So they were going through these motions, even though it was unfortunately very clear that four-year-old Jeremy was dead. He's sick. It had been eight months to the day that Irene had died when Jeremy was found dead. Seems a little controlling in even his murders. Yeah. And it did not seem real to everyone else who was around the situation. When Jack called Denise to tell her the horrible news, now this is Irene's best friend, she screamed at him, how can this be? How can two people die for no reason within eight months of each other? Because these are like her god babies, you know? Jack said he had no idea and that the coroner's office was investigating. And the coroner's office was investigating because it was a mother and son who lived in the same house. They did extensive testing on the Barron household to exclude mold or any other contaminants that might have been in the household that were causing death. They found nothing. So then they're like, well, maybe it's genetic. Maybe there is some genetic component here that we're missing, which means that they would have to discover what had killed Irene and Jeremy pretty quickly because it would stand to reason that Ashley, who's three years old at this point, could be in danger. Yep. And she was, of course, but not because of any genetic reason. Well, kind of. I mean, I guess it is a genetic reason. (laughs) Yeah, who her father is. Yeah. The authorities were still not suspicious of Jack, however. So they ran test after test on little Ashley, as well as Irene's parents and Jack himself, to detect if there was any hereditary condition at play. And they did find that Ashley may have sleep apnea and potentially a burgeoning little heart defect. But they said that it was really hard to tell because the tests that they did were not designed for three-year-olds. So like a lot of these things, you have to have something fit on your face or you have to have something fit on your chest. And none of these things were the right size for that small of a child. Okay. And their bodies do completely different things, like a three-year-old body versus like a 30-year-old's body. So they were like, yes, maybe these could be things that we have to watch out for, and you certainly should watch out for them. But I think we're going to have to keep testing her as she gets older to be really sure if she has these conditions. Okay. To be safe, Ashley was fitted for a 24-hour heart monitor. So Jack could track any irregular heart activity. But because Ashley was three turning four, she, of course, didn't understand the importance of wearing this harness. And she didn't want to wear the harness 24-7 because it was uncomfortable. Despite several doctors telling Jack that he had to make her wear it because it could save her life, he did not. Hmm. He refused to make her wear the heart monitor. Irene's family were besides themselves because they did not live with her. So they couldn't be the ones to make her wear it 24-7. And they were already reeling from the loss of their daughter and their grandson. And now when Jeremy's autopsy findings came out undetermined, just like Irene's had been, there was just more confusion about what was going on. Absolutely. Could you imagine? There was some suspicion about potentially Jack doing something. But I think that at this point, they were still more concerned that there was some mysterious medical ailment that could hurt Ashley, which is why they were so worried about her not wearing her heart monitor. In late 1993, Jack was put in touch with the country star Winona Judd due to his dual tragedies. And she became a great comfort to him in his time of grief. So I shared quite a bit about this at the beginning of this episode. 
But what I did not share was that Jack began telling his friends and family that they were potentially starting a romantic relationship, that she was interested in him romantically, that the first time she called, they spent two hours on the phone together. He took down all of the pictures of Irene, which were pretty much already gone at that point anyway, the mother of his children. And he put up all of the photos of himself meeting Winona and then subsequently when Ashley met Winona. So there was pictures of Winona Judd all over his house and not his dead wife. Your pet's a member of the family, so don't feed them like they're in the doghouse. Give them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's needs so you can bring out their best. Nom Nom's made with real whole food you can see and recognize without any additives or fillers that contribute to bloating and low energy. That's because Nom Nom uses the latest science and insights to make real good food for dogs. Their nutrient-packed recipes are crafted by board-certified veterinary nutritionists, made fresh and shipped free to your door. Nom Nom's already delivered over 40 million meals to good dogs like yours, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail wags. We, Andy, are currently in the grips of a real puppy summer over here. Our burner, Artie, has been loving the leg, and we want to keep her fueled with good food so she can continue to try to upend my paddleboard while I am out there. (laughs) And speaking of growing puppies, guys, this puppy has gone from like 12 pounds to 85 in something like I don't know, eight months. So she definitely needs the best food for her growing body. I will be putting up, I think, an Instagram story of her enjoying Nom Nom because she loves it. So cute. I feel like Nom Nom is just the perfect food for her and I can't wait to see her grow with it. Mm, I know. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers. No nonsense, just nom nom. Nom nom. Go right now for 50% off your no-risk two-week trial at trynom.com slash lovemurder. Spelled try n o m dot com slash lovemurder for 50% off. Trynom.com slash lovemurder. It was weird too because obviously people expected him to be sad about what was going on in his life and instead he was bragging about his connection with the country star and how they were just on the same wavelength and how pretty she was and how nice she was and how she really, really liked Ashley. He's like already like casting her as a stepmother in his mind. Now, of course, Irene's best friend, Denise, was aghast and did not think for one second that Winona Judd had any interest in Jack beyond just being a good person. Yeah. She told author Carlton Smith that she realized the following during this period. So basically after she's going through this, this is what she said about Jack. It was as if Jack could not stand being what he really was, that it wasn't good enough. Always there had to be some sort of saga, some drama in which Jack played the starring role. That was what the Winona Judd interlude showed, she thought. Jack's need to be someone, to be seen as powerful, as worthy, as worth the interest of a famous star. He was, she concluded, a little boy trapped in an adult's body. His psychic needs for domination and control at the forefront of his personality, spiraling out of an appalling lack of self-esteem. Wow. And when she thought even deeper about it, she could see how Irene had accepted Jack for what he was, how she had made allowances for him. Irene, Denise thought, always had cared for the weak and the defenseless. And at heart, that's what Jack was, a little boy terrified about what it meant to be a man. Wow. Snaps. Spot on. By all accounts, despite her family tragedies, Ashley was a very delightful and loving child. She had a very positive outlook. It did crush her grandparents' hearts, though, Irene's parents, because they would be looking through a photo album and she'd be like, is that my mommy? That she couldn't remember. That, That she'd be like pointing at Irene and being like, is that her? And so it was just breaking their hearts. But everyone was fully in love with this child. She was sweet. She was affectionate. She was adorable. And Roberta, who is Jack's mom, had a really good friend named B. Kennedy who had three daughters herself that were just a little bit older than Ashley. And 
they would often watch Ashley and they got so close that B actually offered to adopt Ashley. Because she just fit in with the family, Ashley would cry every time she had to leave. She wanted to be part of their family. And Roberta, who is her grandmother, even thought it was a good idea. She was like, I don't know if Jack is really cut out to be a single dad. And this is a way she could have a full family, siblings, everything. Yeah. But Jack wouldn't consider it. If this was an emotionally healthy person… Uh-huh. I do understand, like, you go through a couple tragedies and then they want to take your last remaining child away. But obviously, knowing what we clearly know, that's not the case. Not the case, yeah. To both families' relief, though, it did seem that Jack was potentially taking Ashley's health concerns a little bit more seriously. He hired a nurse named Jill to watch Ashley when he worked the night shift. So she was fully trained. She was aware that Ashley had some heart issues potentially. And the deal with Jill was that when she worked the night shift, like many babysitters would just go over there and fall asleep because it's just a healthy kid sleeping and they'd wake up if the kid cried. But because she was a nurse, she actually would stay awake all night and she would be monitoring Ashley's breathing. So Jill watched Ashley all throughout the spring and summer of 1994 with no problems, no signs of any health issues. On the evening of August 6, 1994, Jill arrived at the Barron house at 10.45 p.m. Mm. Jack gave Jill a glass of strongly brewed iced tea, which was the way Jill liked her iced tea a little bit stronger, but she said that this one was really strong. Okay. It's weird. And then he left for work. Jill said that she checked on Ashley around midnight. She appeared to be asleep. She said that she was facing the wall and lying on her side wearing 101 Dalmatian pajamas. Jill lay down on the couch and promptly fell asleep, which was not Jill's usual MO. She had never fallen asleep. After drinking tea, strongly brewed tea. Exactly, which I think is why she likes strongly brewed tea so that she would stay up the whole night. So this was unlike Jill. At four in the morning, she woke up again because she had to go to the bathroom. And at that time, she checked on Ashley who she said was now lying on her back, but she wasn't moving. (sighs) And she could not wake her up. Ashley's little body also was cold to the touch. So she immediately dialed 911 and was like, I'm going to do CPR right away because I'm a nurse. And she went to do CPR, but she said she could not pry Ashley's mouth open because the rigor has already set in. What? Is that possible in four hours? I mean, when the EMTs arrived, they said, we think that she has been passed away for more than four hours. It's been at least four hours, they said. But she checked on her. And that's the confusing thing. This is the big question about Ashley's death. We'll get into what the prosecution thinks and what the possibilities are with Ashley's death. But Jill was so hysterical at this point. It's possible she confused things. They said that she was so hysterical that she needed medical attention herself from the AMTs. Um, yeah. Could you imagine? This whole thing is fucked up. And once again, him involving someone else, like an innocent person, in the death of his child. Like, are you fucking serious? We'll talk about this more later. But there was some suspicion, though it was never proven because no one tested Jill on the site, that maybe he drugged her tea. Yeah, of course. Because she was, like, freaking out. She was like, I've never fallen asleep. That was my one job. I've never done this before. She's going to live with this the rest of her life. But she maintained that she checked on her at midnight. But if she was drugged at 1045, I don't know if we can take what she saw seriously. But that's not on her. No, it's definitely not on her. But So you can imagine this poor woman has all of these guilty feelings when she's not the one who did this. She took the Ashley's death very, very hard. So the Pagets, that's Irene's family and Denise, and even those now who worked in the coroner's office, all suspected that this had to be murder. Three healthy people don't just drop dead in just over two years. It just does not happen. No, and two children. Two children. The statistical anomaly of this just it begs you to look closer at what's going on. So this time, this is the first time they're doing an autopsy looking for foul play. Like, they're like, okay, we have to find it. 
but it's interesting because Ashley had no signs of bodily harm whatsoever. Both Irene and Jeremy had the petechia in the blood vessels in their eyes that would obviously indicate asphyxiation, but Ashley did not. Additionally, there was no injuries to Ashley's neck muscles, no lung hemorrhages, no brain bruises that are commonly seen in asphyxiation, nothing. Regardless, Ashley's death was finally being investigated as a murder, now as were the other two barons. So they don't have anything going on, but they're like, we're going to say that still the cause of death is undetermined because we haven't found out what it is, but homicidal violence cannot be excluded. So that's the first time that little note is being added into one of these reports. Good. And as if Irene's loved ones weren't completely disgusted by Jack before, just listen to how he behaved at his child's funeral. Jack showed up to the funeral laughing with one of his friends wearing the wise guy shirt. I knew you were going to say that. To his child's funeral. And he was holding this extra large floral arrangement and he was telling everyone at the funeral that when Nona Judd sent it to him and had called to give her personal condolences to him and everyone was aghast that this was literally a funeral for a four-year-old child, his four-year-old child. And he was talking about some random country star. At that point, the Pagets were 100% convinced that Jack had killed his entire family. And they began to go after the police. They're like, hey, we're going to call you every day. Why aren't you looking into this? How is this man getting away with it? Who is he going to kill next? Like, what? how many people have to die before you do something? But they didn't know that the coroner's office was already working with homicide at that point to nail this guy. They were very convinced also that he was killing them. Well, the coincidence alone that three people in the same home, all otherwise healthy, had died was enough to necessitate a closer look. One coroner's deputy had picked up on a chilling pattern. All three of the barons had died on the seventh of the month. And all of the sevenths, all of those dates, had fallen on Sundays. Everyone killed on Sunday the 7th. When they looked through Jack's family history, interviews, everything that covered his life, they discovered that his father, Elmore, was born on August 7th, 1938, which, by the way, August 7th was the day that Ashley was killed. And it turns out when you looked back at the perpetual calendar that August 7th, 1938, fell on a Sunday. Whoa. So fucked up. He's serial killing his entire family for what? To get his dad's attention? What is this? Now they know this. So they're like, okay, he obviously has issues with his father. But they couldn't figure out exactly how Jack had killed them. So they're like, we know there's like some sick psychological motive. We know he killed them. We just do not know how. We cannot figure this out. Have they exhumed the other bodies? No. Okay. Furthermore, he had made very sure that someone else, as you pointed out, had found all of his victims, which gave him an alibi every single time. However, it became clear when examining coroner's reports that he had killed Irene before he had left from work, obviously. And he had lied about seeing her alive. So that's easy. Like, he's like, yeah, she was alive at 11 p.m. And at the time, they had taken him for face value because when they determine the approximate time that people died, there's so many variables that they always give themselves a few hours window. So they're like, okay, well, she could have died as early as 730, but that doesn't mean she didn't die at 1130 or midnight. So they took him at face value. But obviously now they're looking back at it and they're like, he lied. He had killed her before he left for work, obviously, which is horrible if you think about it, because that means he left his two and three-year-old children alone in the house with their dead mother. Yes. To find her. And God forbid they had an accident or anything happened to them. Yeah, but that would take care of what else he was going to do. So what is psycho? Then he had likely killed Jeremy and staged the scene while the babysitter was trying to get in. I'm wondering if he was still setting up Jeremy to look like he was sleeping. And that's why he didn't answer the door when she came over the first time. And then, of course, there's Ashley. 
which Jill had claimed she was alive at midnight and that her body had changed position. But like we said, she was also hysterical. She may have been drugged. She was racked with guilt. So I don't know if we can necessarily take her initial statements as fact. At the end of the day, though, they knew that at least two out of three of the murders, he had no longer had an alibi. As they launched a full-scale investigation into Jack Barron, he skipped town, he sold his house in Sacramento, and he moved back in with his mom, Roberta, in Benicia, California, which is pretty much like way East Bay. It's near San Francisco, but it's about 40 minutes northeast of Oakland, which is already on the east. So this was not an ideal situation, to say the least. Jack refused to help Roberta pay the bills or do any chores around the house. He wasn't working, and he should have had money because he had cashed in on life insurance policies for his entire family. So there's no reason why he should not be helping Roberta around the house. He also was having her cook for him, do his laundry. He is a 30-something-year-old man, and Roberta's friends said it was more like having a surly, belligerent teenager around. He'd sit in his room and play with his trains, and he'd just yell at his mother. Ew. He's like, Mom, meatloaf. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought of, too. <laughs> Mom, meatloaf! <laughs> Basically that. He's just a mean adult baby. So Roberta's friend said that Jack was verbally abusive to her, demanded that she wait on him hand and foot. Roberta had long since divorced her second husband, the second guy she married. And she did at this time have a long-term live-in boyfriend named Tim. But the fighting between Roberta and Jack and Jack and Tim got so bad that Tim left the house and Roberta. He said, I'm out. He's like, your son is a psycho serial killer. Yeah. So he also said, you're choosing your son over me. You're choosing your son over yourself right now. And I'm not going to sit here and watch it. By January, the situation was bleak, but Roberta was heartened when Jack got a job and promised to start contributing to the household. Jack had finally accomplished his dream. He had scored a job as an assistant conductor with Amtrak. Still obsessed with making daddy happy somehow. Publicly, now this is going to get into what you asked what Roberta thought. Publicly, Roberta loudly shot down any whiff of suspicion about her son. So there was some family friends that said if it was even broached, she'd be like, absolutely not. How dare you say something? He's suffering. But privately, her best friend B said that she was in turmoil. On January 25th, 1995, the death certificate on little Ashley was publicly filed. And her best friend knew that she read the report, which again said undetermined, but it also had that line that said homicidal violence cannot be excluded. Yep. So her friend said that after reading that, Roberta had to grapple with her gut feeling that her only child may have also been the monster who killed her only grandchildren, which I am wondering if she had some suspicions earlier on, which is why she was trying to get her son to adopt out Ashley. Usually a grandmother would not be encouraging a child to let another family adopt their grandchild. No. I feel like normally we have instincts that tell us things that we might not want to see or hear, but there's a reason that it's telling us these things. Yeah. And so I think she was going through a lot at this point. Of course. There was another friend that came to stay with them during this period and also witnessed Jack being very verbally abusive to Roberta and said that Roberta had privately said to this friend, I'm over this situation. I'm going to ask him to leave. I'm going to ask him to get his own place. He can't stay with me anymore. And it seemed like maybe she was also starting to think that he potentially was a killer and she wanted him out of her home. But we can never know for sure what Roberta knew and what she intended to do because on Monday, February 27th, 1995, Jack Barron came home after work around 1.30 or 2 p.m. and reported that he found his mother, Roberta, dead in her own bed. But 27th, not 7th. So it's still a Sunday because technically when they get into it, it looks like the murder happened on a Sunday. But 
I think he was losing the plot at this point. Yeah. He would have had to wait like six more months for a seven Sunday. Something had happened between him and Roberta. There's speculation at that point that she may have confronted him about her suspicions. She may have just told him that he had to move out because this is not a seventh. It's also he didn't design it in a way that somebody else would find the body. He had no choice but to come home from work and say he found the body. But it is like the other deaths where all of these victims were found in their bedclothes in their bed. And there was another thing that he didn't do the same. Well, no one had ever been able to figure out how his three previous victims had been killed. He had lost it on Roberta. And her autopsy was a very different story. Roberta, too, had the particular hemorrhages like Irene and Jeremy. But she also had a light red abrasion on her nose. And inside her mouth, Roberta had a half-inch abrasion on the lower inner lip. It was evidence that someone had held a pillow over her face, which caused the abrasion on her nose, but also caused her to bite through her own lip while she was being smothered to death. (sighs) He had been smothering all of them to death with pillows. I mean, that's like literally what I would have thought from the makeup on the first one. But obviously he did all of the right things for the cops when he came home. And this is very hard to tell. We've talked about this in previous cases. When somebody is smothered to death, it is very, very, very hard to tell what has killed them because they don't have the broken hyoid bone or the marks around the neck in other asphyxiation cases. But it is just as brutal, the killing. Of course. It is just as brutal. Being smothered by someone who you're supposed to love you. And if you are sleeping, it's shocking. Yeah. It's also, I feel like, really befits his character because there is also a cowardly part of it where you don't have to look at their face. 100%. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, like, actually look at your victims while you're doing it. Yeah, you're really a wise guy. (laughs) That shirt just makes me – it gives me the icks and it also makes me want to cry. The most major ick ever. Yeah. So – Roberta's autopsy also showed numerous particular hemorrhages over her right lung and a brain hemorrhage consistent with asphyxial death. (sighs) So the breaking of pattern here with how aggressively she had been smothered shows that there was a considerable amount of rage in this one. Yes, and like enough evidence to nail him now, right? Finally, and this is he could have potentially gotten away with murdering his wife and his two young, adorable baby children if he had not lost it on his mother who had given him everything. Yeah, but he was destined to lose it. It's, I mean, this is, I'm not a psychologist, but this is a case study right here. (sighs) So speaking of psychology, one theory about why Jack did this is that he suffered from Munchausen by proxy syndrome, which I'm sure most of you know about, but it's when a parent, usually the mother, purposely makes their child sick or kills them for attention. And Jack absolutely did revel in the attention he received after Irene died. He was chasing that high, the sympathy, the love, the attention that he got from a country superstar he super admired. And it seems like every time that attention started to go away as people moved on and carried on with their lives, he wanted to put himself back in the spotlight and there was another kill. For this reason, Jack Barron is very commonly known as a rare male Munchausen killer. I even read a Medium article by Delani R. Bartlett and it was titled Jack Barron Munchausen by Proxy Dad. Munchausen by proxy is already a very rare disorder, and only about 3 to maybe 5% of all cases are perpetrated by men. So obviously, if he did suffer from this, this is a big case because it's such an anomaly. Wow, only 3% by men? Yes, this is mostly known to women. And where this doesn't actually fit what the clinical diagnostic criteria for Munchausen syndrome by proxy is, 
is a couple reasons. One, normally the mother, because it's usually a mother, enjoys making the child sick so that they can look like a caretaker, so that they can have prolonged attention as they fight for their child's life, so they can look like this benevolent healer who loves their child. That's the attention that they enjoy getting. And it doesn't always behoove them to kill their child because at some point the attention will end then because the child's gone and people grieve and then they get over it. And so obviously he wasn't making his family members sick for long periods of time. He was snuffing out their life very quickly. So that's where it doesn't exactly fit the diagnostic criteria. The other part is that there should be no other external incentives. It should be all about the attention this person is receiving. Yeah, it's like it doesn't fit. He needs like his own. It's like a different diagnosis. And because there's also other psychological elements at play. And he got something like in today's money, $84,000 in insurance money on Irene, Jeremy and Ashley. But he stood to collect in today's money more like 266000 from Roberta. Plus, he would have gotten her condominium and anything that was involved in her estate. Yeah. I feel like using the Munchausen by proxy is kind of an excuse for him just being a psychopath serial killer. Yeah. Because I read all over, it's like, this is the Munchausen dad. And I was like, I don't know if it really sounds like it fits to me. But then again, here's the other thing. Because there's so rarely male sufferers. That maybe this is what it would look like. Maybe it looks differently. It presents differently in males. It's possible, yes, that he is one of these rare male sufferers of Munchausen by proxy. Whatever the motive is, they finally had enough evidence to arrest Jack Barron. And they did so on July 17th, 1995, which coincidentally would have been Irene's 38th birthday had she lived. You like special dates? There's a fucking special date for you, Jackie boy. I like to feel like Irene was karma ferrying there. Same. Speaking of special dates, once again, specifically his kill dates associated with his father's birthday, What did his estranged father have to say about all of this when the news broke about Jack's possible motive and how it was tied to him? The Sacramento Bee reporter, Sam Stanton, tracked down Elmer Barron, who was apparently living in the southeast part of the United States at that point, and asked him how he felt about his son. And this is what Elmore had to say. It bothers me. And if he did, in fact, do all of this, I'd like to be the one who pulls the switch San Quentin on him. Because if I brought this turkey into the world, I want to be the one who takes him out. Turkey. (sighs) It sounds to me like he knew I was going to hear about this sooner or later, the 7th. And he knew it would ring a bell with me. And I don't know if he was jealous, because it was sometimes such a big to-do over my birthday, like, way more than his. Uh... When he was a child, it was more about your birthday than his? When he left Roberta, Elmore said Jack was 12. Now I've heard from Jack it was 13. Elmore said he'd given Jack a choice of which parent to live with, and Jack had chosen Roberta, which I do not know if that is true or not. Over the next 20 years, Elmore told Stanton he'd only seen Jack about three times and talked to him maybe a couple times on the phone. Elmore sounded as though he did not like Jack very much. He said, quote, I worked for the Southern Pacific Railroad for 30 years, and he's a railroad buff, and every time I get around him, that's all he wanted to do, was talk trains, and it just irritated me. I could stand to be around him for, like, a day. Wow. Father of the year over here. Bravo. Happy Father's Day to that piece of shit. Oh, man. Well, I hope all of you at home are celebrating with better dads than Elmore. And certainly a lot better dad than Jack Barron, who finally went on trial in early 2000. Jack elected to have a bench trial, which of course means no jury. The prosecution revealed a note that had been found in Irene's personal effects. The note was to Jack and it said, I'm really sorry you're unhappy right now. We have so much to be happy and thankful for. It really upsets me when I hear you talk about divorce. (sighs) The uh, prosecution contended that Jack wanted Irene out of his life to make room for Starla, the coworker he was involved with, 
Then, after he did so, the children proved to be more difficult than he imagined, and he could not handle them on his own. So he killed them as well, with the added motivation of the insurance money. The prosecution basically compared it to him following Irene around with a vacuum, being like the children were like the tracks in the carpet that he had to smudge out. They no longer fit his life. They messed up his house. They didn't listen to him. They didn't let him take a nap. Yeah. Poor Jeremy is screaming for his mother. They were no longer anything he wanted in his life. But he also, it was premeditated because of the, the grave sites. It, it had to be, right? Yeah. Yes. The prosecution further contended that Roberta was going to ask Jack to leave because they had friends of hers testify to what she had spoken to them before she passed away and that she maybe had confronted him about his role in all of the family's deaths when he killed her as well. I'm sure she did. I'm sure she was like, you need to move out. And he had like a fucking fit. Oh, God, what a horrible thing to feel as a mother. Oh, my God. Jack's attorney argued that the family had hereditary heart problems and that he was 100% innocent, which doesn't even make sense because Irene and Roberta are not related by blood. So not all four of them could have the same hereditary heart problem. Good job, defense attorney. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they gotta, somebody's got to defend this piece of shit. So Jack took the stand himself and he spent nine hours crying and refuting the charges against him saying that he was still in love with Irene at the time of her death, that he, of course, loved his children, that he had nothing to do with this. Well, the Sacramento judge ended up convicting Jack Barron on three first-degree murders and acquitting him on one. Do you want to guess which one he got off on? Maybe Irene? No, it was Ashley. Ashley, really? It's because of the babysitter's initial testimony. Ugh. That kind of breaks my heart a little bit for the babysitter. Because she had been tested and there were potentially sleep apnea or some heart issues, or maybe those two things go together, whatever it was, there was that. And then there was also the fact that she had claimed to see her alive at midnight because Jack did have it a solid alibi for that time after he left the home until he came home after Ashley's death. I mean, he had probably figured shit out by then, too, because he had already killed two people. I very much think he drugged her. And I think that if you're in a confused state and you're drugged and you don't know what's going on, it's possible that she believed what she saw. Absolutely. I sometimes don't know what's dream and reality when I take a Benadryl. Exactly. So basically, the judge was just saying that there's reasonable doubt there because there was reasonable doubt on the one murder. I mean, if you put it together with the other murders, I feel like a jury of his peers probably would have convicted on all four, which is why he went for a bench trial, because a judge is more likely to be unemotional about it and go by the letter of the law. And in this case, there was reasonable doubt about Ashley's murder. OK, but he still murdered three other people. So please tell me he went away for life. He did. And in California at the time, there were special circumstances that if you kill X amount of people, meaning multiple people at different times, including three people at different times, which means you're a serial killer, then you will automatically receive no parole. So he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. He was 38 years old when he was sentenced, and he will be there for the rest of his days. It looks like he's still alive. Now, Andy, I know you were concerned about Winona Judd. Was I? I don't want you guys to think that I just teased something about Winona Judd at the, the beginning, and that I wasn't going to circle back to it because we're coming back on the Judd train. According to a RadarOnline.com article written by Teresa Roca in 2019, Winona's ex-husband, Arch Kelly, said in 1999 that Jack Barron made a phone call. They said he didn't identify himself, but they were very, very convinced it was Jack. Threatening to kill him, her husband at the time, and their son, Elijah, before he went to trial. He was saying, I'm going to come and take care of you. The family believed that Jack intended to kill Winona's husband and son and then kidnap her. The family was kept under 24-hour guard until Jack was sentenced and taken to prison. 
terrifying. No good deed goes unpunished, huh? She's trying to do something nice for somebody. You know what's really funny, too, is that I looked at Winona's Wikipedia page just to see if they had mentioned this in, like, you know, strange events in her life. And it didn't even warrant a mention. <laughs> good. It's, it shouldn't. Like, like, it's... It shouldn't. I was like, you piece of shit, Jack Barron. You were so inconsequential to Winona Judd that y- you're not even on her Wikipedia page. Yep. Oh, so heartbreaking case. I mean, pff, those poor families and those poor little sweet souls. I know. It's so sad. You will absolutely lose it when you see the pictures of these adorable children. I feel like murdering your own children doesn't go well for you in life in prison. No. And you know what's interesting? He's actually in like a California substance abuse treatment facility. And he has been for some time, but I could not find out why he's not in more of a formal federal prison situation. He did appeal in several times. He appealed several times. And one of his appeals was about the fact that the note from Irene should not have been let in. But all of his appeals have been denied. He's going to die in prison or in whatever facility he's in. But he's behind bars, regardless of what type of facility he's in. In conclusion, this Father's Day, we want to remind all of you that an absent piece of shit dad does not define who you are or your worth, and the world would have been a much better place if Jack Barron had not let it. Yes, absolutely. Jack Barron is not the role model for how to get one of those number one dad, world's greatest dad shirts, you know? No. And additionally... Maybe murdering your entire family is not a way to get your favorite country artist to recognize you. No, it's more like a restraining order. <laughs> As always, trust your gut when it comes to love so Winona Judd doesn't have to go into hiding. <laughs> love y'all. Bye. Bye.